welcome to the Straight Out of BS podcast. Thank you guys so much for your continued support. Uh, we're getting a lot of new members and just a lot of comments and stuff's kind of blowing up right now. So let's just use this momentum to get the, really get this podcast out there and get the word out there about these places. Share the videos. If you're not subscribed, subscribe to the channel. Like um, like the videos. All of that really helps the algorithm like more than you know. And uh, I want to do or thank you to my Patreons. I appreciate you. Links are in the description for that if you're interested. And I want to do a moment of silence for the person still suffering with a uh, uh, addiction or intrusive thoughts or anything like that. So on the count of three, I'm going to do a moment of silence. One, two, three. Okay, thank you for that. And without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce my guest for the day. Go ahead and introduce yourself and where you went and what years. Uh, my name is Ruby Savoy. It was Ruby Evans back then. Um, I went to Cross Creek Manor, 1997 to 2000. September 28th, 1997 and then I left December but I'm not sure of the exact date but I know it was December of 2000. Okay and uh can you walk us through like what was going on before you got sent to the program did you know you were going to get sent there uh did you feel like you were doing just regular teenage behaviors or do you feel like you actually like nobody deserved to get sent there right but like do you feel like it was more uh, merited in your uh situation? Definitely. I was pretty out of control. Um, my mom was a motivational speaker and she was a single parent and she was dealing with a lot of shit from when she was little. Um, when I was like around six, her mom committed suicide when she was 13. And then her dad was an absent father, kind of was like a producer in Hollywood, kind of just, she was super neglected. And then, um, in turn, when I was little, she got divorced from my dad when I was two and I moved up to Oregon and then she did everything by herself. So she went into counseling, but I remember a lot coming up when she was little, a lot of crying, a lot of promiscuity. <clears throat> um, and so she got in, she went to college, went to the university, got her degree and started being a, like a, what is it called? What are they? Motivational speaker for teens yeah. about how to love yourself and addiction and recovery and stuff like that. But, um, I was pretty out of control. I started cutting at a very young age, probably like 11. <clears throat> and then when I turned 13, 12, when I turned 12, I started drinking and smoking weed. And then when I turned 13, I got into psychedelics and um, just more of the harder drugs. And then when I was 14, I was running away and I was just, I, I was out of control. So yes, I do think that my behavior was more than what a normal 13, 14 year old should be. I already had like two suicide attempts by the time cross creek um and before that my mom sent me i got she i never i was one that was never i didn't get kidnapped um she and my grandpa transported me to cross creek but i was told that i was there was like kids riding riding on horses and going to the beach and of course we all know now that that those aren't true um but that's what she was being fed and so i've i've gone through a lot of um healing with my mom um i've i've forgiven her for sending me there um but up until recently she would never acknowledge what i went through there the abuse that i endured when i was there literally up until like last week um or a couple days ago when i sent her an email and at first she dismissed it and then several days went by and then she sent me an email saying that she was sorry for years with recognition for what actually happened actually happening. So with this documentary or docu-series coming out, I really feel like it brought a lot of people together. Uh, like, are you kidding me? That's pretty amazing. And now we can actually have our voices heard and hopefully shut the rest of the programs that are still open down. For sure. Sorry, I went off. No, no, you're totally fine. You're totally fine. That that just happens naturally in these in these interviews. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you got transported by your by your um by your your family. Uh, when you mm -hmm. got there, uh, what happened when you got there? Can you walk us through like what happened when you got there? Um, I'm not sure what time it was. <laughs> um, they basically told me to take out my nose piercings and I looked at my mom because she told me I, I was able to have piercings there and I, I knew right away that this wasn't going to go okay. And so my mom and they ended up escorting my mom out because she was crying hysterically and um, they, they that was the last time I saw my mom. Um, 
she was like leaving, crying, bawling. And then they put my bags to the side. I was at the manor. So it was at the manor at Cross Creek in Leverkin. And they told me to do a strip search and took me in the back and did a strip search. The whole squat and cough thing. And then they gave me a uniform to wear and they took my shoes away. And I was only able to wear slippers until I got um, face phase four, which they would give you shoes at phase four. Okay. Do you remember them giving you a rule manual, buddying you up with anybody, telling you the rules, anything like yeah, that? Yeah, they do. Um, um, Adina Flavin was my was my hope buddy, I believe. Um, she's no longer with us, um, unfortunately. Yeah, she died a few years ago. I'm still in contact with her brother sometimes. <clears throat> but um, she was my hope buddy. Um, I remember them giving me the rules, but honestly, there, there's a lot of, um, I don't know if what happened is real. And then there are certain things I definitely know were real, but everything is kind of like hazy and a blur. It's almost like when you experience a sudden death in the family, everything like in a funnel, funnel and everything sounds and looks different. That's kind of what I have some memories that are like that from there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how long, you said it pretty much instantly, you realized that it was uh, like, what the fuck is this place because of the nose piercing thing, correct? Yes. I, I knew right away it wasn't a boarding school, especially when they took away my clothes and it went through my bags. And I didn't even have, I didn't even get to pack my bags. Um, so when my mom picked me up, I was around away. Um, I was staying at a friend's house and she picked me up and they took me to this place. I don't even remember the name, but it was a holding facility in Oregon. I believe it was in Eugene. Interesting. Um, yeah, I was there for like, two two or three weeks and the counselor there decided that I should go to Cross Creek um because of my all my the things that led up to me being there um I I was super at risk for things so that was their decision I totally forget the name um but yeah, yeah and then so that's that's interesting um <clears throat> uh so how long after you got there did it did they put you through your first seminar Oh, okay. So the, 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 so I got there relatively at night, the day after Ron Garrett held one of his groups, his community groups, there was like tons of people in a circle and there was something going on. Of course, I didn't know what it was because it was my first day there and being my first day the night before I didn't get much sleep because I had a lot of anxiety and just all this shit. So I actually fell asleep and, um, Ron Garrett said, how dare you fall asleep? And everyone had to line up and give me feedback for the very first time. I'm like, what the fuck? And I, I couldn't even say like, um, I just gotten here. I didn't sleep. I'm, I'm sorry. Like there was no, the first time I had to go write, um, I had worksheets that very first day about Hawaii falling asleep while someone was sharing was, um, disrespectful and I had to write about it, you know? Um, but I don't even remember how long it took me to go to discovery. Um, but I do remember, and this is where it gets like, this is one of my core memories that, that I have that's really emotional for me. Um, I was in line for a seminar. I don't know if it was discovery or focus though. Um, but I was apparently was standing in line by somebody Ron Garrett thought wasn't working for me. So when I um, sat down and the the 2001 Space Odyssey song ended and I was sitting down, they called on me and they basically said, if you were sitting by someone that's not working, why would you do that? You're kicked out of here. And I was pissed because I knew like going through these seminars was your way to get out of the program faster. And that set me back a whole other month or two. So I was like pissed. So I got up and I slammed the door. Um, but because I did that, Ron Garrett came after me and he pull, pulled up my shirt above my head, exposing my breasts to everybody, choking me out by my shirt, dragging me up the rec stairs and threw me in isolation room. And I probably was there for a good, I don't know, at that, that time I was on ISO a lot, but that time probably like three days. And then I really knew like this, this place wasn't, I don't know. I didn't know what, what to think. <laughs> yeah. But that was kind of beginning of everything for me. Okay. I've heard from several people that Ron Garrett would like target specific people and like take it out uh, like more intensely on certain people. Do you feel like that was uh, something in your case? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, there was some time where we were going around telling our, uh, you know, stories of why we were there. And um, 
I, I was raped before I got in the program and I had said that and I basically told, he told me that it was my fault, probably because of how I was dressing and how I acted. We all know now that like, it doesn't matter how a woman's dressed, it's not our responsibility to avoid getting raped. We all know this from the Me Too movement and everything. <clears throat> Anyone should know that anyways, but you know how it is. Um, yeah. So yeah, he, and then he would, he would, uh, he would just get in people's faces really aggressively. And then of course I've seen him get physical with other people like that but that was my the only time he's really gotten physical with me was that one time but there was other times where he, he would just hold these groups and he would get in our faces and put us down and just ridicule us okay um how um how was your program like did you struggle following the rules did you get consequenced a lot did you try to work the program but still uh, felt like 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 for me for example I, I i i got targeted a lot so even when i tried to work my program like uh people would still target me and pick on me and stuff like that so uh did, was it hard for you did were you able to work the program how was your program for you well <laughs> i would say it was more difficult for me um i i've always been one to ask a lot of questions and uh something didn't feel right kind of put a lot of resistance and something definitely didn't feel right but i was so young and this was like the first when you're that young scared and awake um it's all like kind of a mind fuck you know so it's like i i um i was i let's see <laughs> i was there for three years and two months and so obviously I, there was a lot of resistance. I mean, because what you can graduate within like twelve months or so. Supposedly, um, but it took me three years. Yeah, supposedly. But like, like the doc, like what I liked about what the docu series said is like it made it nearly impossible for you to graduate the program. Um, you know, because of all the rules, like minding your face expressions, or you know, just stupid shit that you would never think you would get in trouble for would would get you knocked down points and of course being voted up in group and whatnot that's another thing so I was originally I was signed to d group with Brian Hansen when I first got there um and uh <laughs> one of the big things I remember in that group was it was a lot around I think they put me in that group because it was a lot around a family and like family dynamics and whatnot <clears throat> but um one of my first big uh challenges or processes I guess it was a process um was they took all my things I didn't know about like um suicide notes I was like obsessed with Marilyn Manson like love letters I'd written to him um notebooks covered with stuff paraphernalia <coughs> my really stuff that I had in my room that um my mom thought was non-working for me they set it all up and they had my funeral for me and um, I remember them playing Marilyn Manson and then my mom jumped out and like was doing this weird dance. I'm like, oh, that was the first time I saw my mom. But that was like probably several months, like seven months or so. When I was in the program was the first time I saw her was at that um, process or whatever. So I wasn't, they didn't like what I was doing. I wasn't making enough progress. So they switched me to B group with Garth and I spent the rest of my program with Garth. And he was known for like the most resistant kids. I was on staff buddy a lot. Um, and for people that don't know what that is, what is what is staff buddy? Um, when you are connected to staff all the time, pretty much in ISO, sitting in ISO. So the docu series, what they said theirs was intervention. Is that what they called it, I believe. Yeah. So ISO for us was short for isolation, and it was a small room with a blue padded floor with white concrete walls. And you would just sit in there. And so another thing that they did while, when you were in ISO is they would turn on the air conditioning and take your sweatshirt away. So I had no way to be warm and I was constantly cold all the time. And if, if you spent the night in ISO, they would have these fluorescent lights on that they would not turn off at all. So you would lack sleep and lack being warm. And of course, now we all know that these are like, um, brainwashing mind control techniques that people use for torture um in like concentration camps or whatnot but i didn't know that when i was 14 um so that was i got held i got i i was one of the girls that did a lot of holds um i purposely wore um boxers 
so I wouldn't get wedgies because they used to use wedgies techniques to like make us go down or whatever. So I do remember being sent on a lot, definitely a lot of illegal holds, um, being hogtied without, without the rope, but definitely having two staff hold my, hold my ankles up above and then my arms. So I was like, you know, and I'm a gymnast. I, I spent like 10 years of gymnastics, so I'm pretty flexible. And I remember certain techniques wouldn't work because I was able to like <laughs> bend into a pedal or something. And uh, yeah. But so they would put extra pressure on my neck and on my back so I couldn't breathe. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of that. And then I don't remember the extent of when I actually started working my program. Um, I think that one of the reasons why I started to was because uh, I just I was like, I'm never going to go home. <laughs> like, like it, I'm never going to go home if I don't do something. So I did the whole fake it till you make it thing. <clears throat> okay. Uh, when you saw your parents and they did that obituary thing, was that at PC1 by chance? No, that was not at PC1. That was just a process for um, in my individual group. It had nothing to do with seminars. Okay, like, was it was it your actual mom that came out or somebody representing your mom? <clears throat> it was my mom. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, they did other processes for other girls. Like, um, I, I'm not going to name names, you know, because it's not my yeah. story, but... Uh, yeah. One of the girls in the docu series that came out had the box that she was holding with the papers in it. Well, the girl in a different group than mine when I was there, she had to hold a backpack full of rocks. And every time that she um, got in more trouble, they would put another rock in her backpack. And these are like boulders, by the way, not just like pebbles. So, and she had to walk around like that carry it everywhere with her until her therapist thought it was time for her to like to let go of it it was supposed to be like this is all the bullshit you're holding on to you know isn't it getting heavy kind of thing don't you want to do something about it yeah um so how many seminars did you end up making it through by the time you or first of all did you graduate or did you get pulled I did graduate. I graduated. So I did all the programs um, in Cross Creek. So that's another thing. So the boys ended up coming. I don't remember if it was 98 or 99, but it was all girls when I first got there. And then they transitioned to the boys coming. But at that point, I was almost, I was, I was like on phase four and I was getting ready to go to St. George. And so for people that don't know anything about Cross Creek, um, there was the manor. And then there was the rec center. And so you had half of the girls at the manor and half of the girls at the rec center in their groups or whatever. And they would have, they would sleep at the, um, at the manor. And then there was these two other facilities called South and West where you, you would sleep at. And, uh, I did have one, one time we got in trouble as we were going to steal the night shift. We were going to tie the night shift up and steal our keys and get the fuck out of there. But of course it never nice. happened. Someone, somebody like told on us or whatever, um, so that never happened. We got in big trouble for that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we wanted to leave. Yeah. Um, so, and then another thing which totally creeps me out is they rented the Comfort Inn. It was called CI. And then a lot of the higher phase girls would sleep there. I think you were on phase three or phase four before you went to St. George. You would sleep at the CI, which was a Comfort Inn. And what's more disturbing about that is half of, the, half of that um, hotel was actually for the public. So that's kind of weird keeping teenage girls and sleeping there when it was still open to the public. So trips. The first thing that comes to my mind is like a fucking like, uh, um, trafficking. Yeah, totally. Grooming. Yeah, totally. But that also happened. I noticed not so much with me, but, um, there definitely was, again, I'm not going to name names. Um, but there was two situations that I remember where, there was a staff there, a male staff, um, who ended up marrying a K grouper and the girls in K group came in when they were 12 years old. So they were the young girls and, uh, they got married. I don't know what happened or after, or if they're still married or anything, but that's definitely, I feel like that's manipulation. And then there was another girl that the parents were on board with having her be, um, a nanny to Garth's kids mm -hmm. and a living nanny at his house and that's another thing uh garth used to take us <laughs> over to the house for some time so which i'm i'm a counselor like i'll get into that part later but like that's yeah. a huge boundary. you never take you never take your 
clients to your personal house, first of all. And yeah. then I remember him making us force, um, forcing us to watch him feed a live mouse to his pet snake. And at the time I was like, all these things now looking back, I'm like, that's hella bizarre. But like back then you don't know, you know, cause you're so little, yeah. like, but it was hella weird. So. Yeah, that's very, very peculiar. <clears throat> um, so you were there about three years. Um, did you have, did you get to go to library there? Did you read any good books? If you did, what were some of your favorites? Um, I read the Amazon lady. I think that was one of my, that I kept checking out. Um, the Amazon, it was a book about Amazon women empowerment, female empowerment. And I remember my, I am statement. Um, I'm a soft, precious, vulnerable and honest young woman, but I took the M A N out of woman and put it W um, or M Y N or whatever woman. So it wasn't like, I, I don't know. I had a thing towards guys back then that I didn't like. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, how, uh, what did you think about the lifeboat process in focus? Ooh, um, you know, to be completely honest, I think the only things I remember about seminars were, um, the intro 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 to seminars with the 2001 space odyssey yeah the towel process um and the the i think it was the focus where you they put on a song and and you have the to stretch do, your stretch yeah, there's yeah. the butterfly um the transforming of the butterfly but i don't even remember what my song was like the, a lot of seminars i i completely blocked out um, i do remember with the um with the towel process i remember them getting in my face and egging me on to keep hitting it. And if I, if I stopped, they would, you know, they would threaten me to leave the seminar. And I was like, no, I have to have to do these seminars, but I do vaguely remember the lifeboat process. And I remember, I don't remember if I voted myself on or off, but I had to, you know, think about other people killing other people, theoretically killing, you know, other people yeah. to save myself. Um, but I don't even remember what okay. happened. I don't even remember the only thing I remember in PC one or PC two was making um making a what what is it called? The thing that you make with your parents, like a life contract. contract? Your life contract. contract. Yeah, your life contract. Um and I remember that my mom kept it for years. And uh, she actually ended up kicking me out when I got when I got home because when I turned 18, I came back to Oregon and got a, a butterfly tattoo. Um and she kicked me out because it was on our life contract, even though I was 18. Anyways. That's done. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, what was the hardest part about being there for you and how did you handle it? There's so many things. I don't even know where to begin on that. Um, definitely just being locked up, you know, um, not being able to look out the window, being away from all my friends and my family. Um, you know, I have kids think about sending my kids off to a place like that. Like I could never do that. Like, um, I don't know. All of it was fucked up. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> That's fair. Um, did you enjoy working kitchen? Did you, uh, what did you think of the food? Was it horrible? Was some of it decent? Um, they never let me work kitchen after we stole a knife and we're going to, um, <laughs> That was the whole incident where we stole a knife when we were going to threaten the graveyard lady and take the keys. So they, they wasn't able to work in kitchen after that. Um, the food there was not obviously the best. Like I don't have, I was never really, um, I don't know. I, I gained a lot of weight. And then, um, then when I met with Dr. Goats, um, he prescribed me all these medications and I lost a lot of weight. And then, um, I don't know. I, I remember the big pink cookies, mainly in brownies. <laughs> okay. okay. <clears throat> um, so you, you kind of answered this already, the pill loading you up with pills. Did, did, did they, did they do that right off the bat or did they not do that till mm -hmm. interesting? No, it took, um, that was a little over a year. Um, maybe it was longer than a year when they started doing that. I was definitely with Garth and it was Garth's friend. And they remember, I remember him taking us on a trip to Las Vegas at one point, but I don't even remember. See, I don't remember what happened when we were in Vegas. I remember 
meeting the psychiatrist I don't even know where we stayed like that's how fucked up like did something happen and I blocked it out but like there's certain things I'm like what happened and why can't I remember and yeah. that always trips me out and I've thought about going to hypnotherapy but I don't know if I want to yeah. <laughs> regarding those, those <clears throat> doors. but um uh, they, they, he prescribed me um Adderall, and then I don't remember the other ones, but it was an antipsychotic and antidepressant. Okay. Lilith, knock it off. She's just fucking with everything right now. <clears throat> um, let's see. Did you guys get candy bars once a week? If you're a no, certain level? I, but I remember. Um, I do not remember candy bars. I remember being really, really stoked to be able to have shoes on level four. I remember... Being able to wear my earrings and um, pluck my eyebrows again and wear mascara. But if you put mascara down on your lower lid like it was eyeliner, they would take that privilege away. Um, but that was all like things that you would do at St. George. So for people that don't know, St. George was the higher level facility. So it was a it was an old abandoned motel that they converted into dorms for us. And we would do group there and go to school there. Some girls did end up... Um, going to college or having jobs there but I don't think maybe it was like one or two it wasn't most people okay uh and then so you got on upper levels at level four would you have to police the lower levels at that point um well at that point when I got there that's when they introduced the boys so I think they were like let's get all these girls out of here um and of course probably sure. to make room for all the new girls and new boys coming in so at that point, I didn't have to do that a lot um, because I was I was sent away, and so it was all higher phase girls. But that was a long that was that was a while, you know. I think I was there for two years until I started making progress. Um, a lot of my time was just spent on lower phases, on staff buddy and ISO and um, worksheets and tapes. So, fucking tape so those ruined those books for me because i like world's hundred greatest people and hundred greatest books but not in that way when you had to sit at a chair instead of stare at a red dot on the ceiling or on the wall right in front of you and you couldn't move and you had to finish these tapes it was like pointless yeah absolutely pointless did you get level six did you have to get level six to graduate because like me i i i tried to get level six but yeah, as you probably know level six you can't have a single person stand for you so when you're voting up, yeah, so see, I, I always have one person stand. I don't even remember that part. I do remember my mom and Garth and Ron um, told me I had to get level six for graduated. So I did get level six, but that's another thing. I remember this very clearly. It was, it was right around Christmas time in December. And my mom's like, I want her home. This would be like our third, wait, let's see. That would be my like, like fourth or third. I don't know. It was, I don't, I hadn't been home for Christmas for years. And yeah. my mom was like, I want her home. But they're like, well, she's not ready yet. So I'm pretty sure that my mom forced them to give me level six um, at that time because I'd been there for so long. I was at St. George for over a year. Um, and I, I, there, she was like, why aren't you graduating her? She's obviously ready to come home. I'd been through PC1, PC2. So I just remember, usually for groups, you go around and share stories all I wanted to do is play two songs I played the doors um break on through the other side and an Ani DeFranco song okay and those were your graduation songs yeah nice nice do, um I don't think you guys did but did you guys have a, a crowd surfing sort of ceremony when you graduated I think that was just Spring Creek Lodge just specifically yeah. but that in a in a circle and pretty much said goodbye and, <laughs> and okay. I played things and I don't even remember being picked up and I find it really interesting a lot of people know their intake dates but a lot of people do not know the exact day that they left the program yeah neither do I I know it was some day sometime in December but again yeah. I don't remember the exact day but I know exactly the day I got there it's so like, weird yeah it's crazy <clears throat> okay um so let's see is there anything else you want to touch on about your time at Spring or uh, at Cross Creek? Sorry, there's so many programs. Um, before we move on to the to the next part. Yeah. Um. 
I'll always remember the, the, the best thing that ever happened to me there was making the friendships that I still have. And there are some girls that I still don't know where they are to this day. Um, and I hope they're doing good. And there's other girls that were like some of my best friends there that, um, have died or that aren't doing good. My, one of my best friends is, um, she's been addicted to heroin now for so, so long since like 2010, um, and she's just like gone. She's like just a shell of the person. And I, a lot of people um, that have gone through these programs end up having more mental health issues than people that haven't. And there's a slight, there's a slight few of us that have made it through the other side and have con- done a lot of work on ourselves to the point where we feel like we're okay with talking about it. I remember you asked me to do this podcast a few years ago and I still wasn't ready at that point um, to, to talk about my personal experience. But I think with it getting more recognition, I'm willing to do so because I feel like I have an army of support behind me, which is really good. Yeah, I might as well jump on it when there's uh, like, you know, a huge wave going with it for yeah. sure. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about like... Um, after you graduated, coming home, reintegration into society, what was the hardest for you? Um, what do you still struggle with the most as a result of the program? Um, it's really fucked up, actually. Um, so before I went to the program, I was living in a small town where I live now. I moved back here, Ashland, Oregon. Uh, it's a very small, hippie, miniature San Francisco town. So when I moved there, um, my mom sold her house. First of all, like I was saying, she was a single parent. She sold her house to keep me there for years. So I think it was like over a hundred thousand dollars what she spent on the program, which is could have been used for college or a down payment on a house for me or just something other than that place. <clears throat> but um, so when I got out, she moved to a very small Republican town called Elko, Nevada. So I left half of my junior year because I left in well. I guess it wasn't nearly half, but it was December. So I was in, I was a junior. I got placed in a public school. I didn't have a transition program. Like, um, like I didn't have, I, I went to therapy a couple of times, but I'm like, this is a joke. This isn't helping me. Like, um, but at that point I was already, um, brainwashed. Um, when I was in St. George, I remember buying shoes I would never buy. I was never the the Nike girl. I was always the Vans girl, you know, um, skateboarder, goth, punk. That was like my image or whatever before the program. Afterwards, I was like this prep who wore Nikes and like like just a normal fit in and wear anywhere you are kind of girl. So when I got thrown back into high school, um, obviously it was a regular school I had been in um, isolation and institutionalized for three years and I was like okay like I didn't have a lot of support so I guess you could say I was falling back into bad behavior but it wasn't really bad behavior Um, what happened was I was feeling really isolated I had a lot of anxiety Um, there was too much on my plate too fast I was never um I don't know how to explain it. It just happened too fast. And then um, I started having anxiety. And then I don't even remember what happened. I I didn't know who I was. So I lost it in the bathroom of my downstairs house. I had a Britney Spears moment before she did the Britney Spears. And I shaved my head. I took a bunch of pills and tried to kill myself. Um, and then that's when everything kind of went downhill for me um, after that. And then um, so... It took me a long, long time to even talk about what happened to me at the program. Um, but I knew I wanted to help teenagers in similar situations without the abuse around it or whatever. So I started um, talking to kids just on my own, like talking to homeless kids about like just being there for them, having a listening ear, like just just organically and naturally it would come up and we talk about it. So, um, it wasn't until I was like, um, I'd already had, I had my first son, um, in 2005 and then I got divorced from his dad in 2007 and we moved back to Ashland. And then I met, I met my ex-husband, my second ex-husband. Um, we were together for about 10 years. And then when we separated, 
I, he, it was a really fucked up abusive relationship. It's better now that we're co-parenting and years have gone by, but at the time he kicked me and my kids out of the house and I was a stay at home mom. So I was forced to go back into work. And so I went into the work program and I'm like, I don't want to get a job at freaking Taco Bell or whatever. So there was a girl's home in Ashland and I'm like, you know what? Like, I want to see what this place is about. And so I walked in there and I told them my story and they're like, we really want you to work here. And the girls home do not like Cross Creek. They're, um, they're girls that have been taken away from their home from the state. Um, and this is something I really wanted to make sure, because I've gotten a lot of grief from the WASPs community being a residential treatment counselor when I'm not, it's not that kind of program. These are kids that have been taken away due to severe neglect or abuse, sexual abuse, domestic abuse. Um, some of their parents are both in prison. They have nowhere else to go. So there's these group homes. It's not a program like Cross Creek. Unfortunately, it is fucked up because they're still in the system. Um, and the system, as we all know, is broken. But these kids, obviously, they don't have nowhere to go. It's a free program. They're not getting money. They're getting money from the state. So it's whole. It's a I wanted to work with these kids to help provide a safe place for them to process their trauma. And I'm really good at it. <laughs> um, so I've been doing kind of that for since 2015. I recently got laid off um, for political reasons. I had nothing to do with me or my work. It had to do with the company. Um, um, but yeah, and then I was on maternity leave and they, they like fired me right before I was about to take my maternity leave and all this thing. But now my baby is five months old and looking to go back into mentoring or something so okay. sorry to go on that no, tangent no no totally it's totally fine <clears throat> i actually like it when people <clears throat> do most of the talking i really like it because it's natural it's just a natural interview you know what i mean um okay <clears throat> do you um let's see talking about it with your parents i know you kind of touched on it a little bit um, you said that you've forgiven your parents, but it sounds like you, you're not going to forget what happened, which is pretty much the same position I'm in. Um, how many times did you try to talk about it with your parents before? Like, it sounds like your mom took a long time to come around. What about your dad? Um, my dad was, didn't support my mom in sending me to the program. Um, he wasn't even allowed to come visit me because my mom convinced the program that he was non-working for me. So I wasn't able to see my dad the whole time, but my, I had, my mom was with this guy for a while and he, they, they separated when I was 12. So before I even went to cross Creek, but he came to visit me and he, um, I talked to him about it afterwards and he's like, your mom should have never sent you there. The whole energy. And this is really interesting. He said, when I first walked in there, the whole energy was like, super dark he's like we had these like girls that were like looking at me like I was a rock star like this is his words they're looking at me like I'm a rock star when I'm just a normal person they shouldn't be like idolizing an outsider coming in to see like their you know like family you know and that he knew something was wrong right away and then he brought my little family dog it was a Yorkshire Terrier named Shazam there and uh we were out in the back of the manor and it just all grass and it was just him and I <clears throat> and uh the staff said we couldn't have the dog there and it was really sad and I only had like an hour to spend with him on site um and that was really was hard it, was, that and, uh, was that a visit was that a visit it was a visit. He he came all the way from Oregon to come visit me um and he didn't want me to be here. Um the only people that had that wanted me to be here was my mom, and she still thinks that it saved my life, um, even with all the things I've told her. And maybe she's right, you know, for that time being, because I wasn't trying to kill myself or whatever at that time or using drugs because obviously I couldn't. Other things were happening to me, um, but I did end up trying to kill myself after the program. So I'm like, you know, um, whatever way she she feels like she needs to justify it. I know there's a lot of guilt there that she, she shuts down and stuff. Um, but it was really nice to get her to say, I'm sorry for all those hurtful things or harm that has happened to you. That, that was like huge. And that was just like a couple days ago. So well, congrats. Yeah. <laughs> She's still, all, I like last night I saw her, I'm like, Hey, thank you for saying that. And she changed the subject. So there's still some, you know, stuff there yeah, yeah. <clears throat> all right if you could go back in a time machine and not go through uh 
th that place, would you do it knowing what you know now and why? So, well, hell yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't want to go back through that. Um, it's caused a lot of, I have serious PTSD from, from being in there and a lot of trust issues that, that affect my relationships. I've had to do tons of therapy and I, I'm a person that actually enjoys therapy. I like working on myself. I, I like being a better person. I like exposing my wounds and pulling up the roots and like making room for like flowers and like, you know, like metaphorical flowers or whatever, but like, I want to be a healthy person. And um, that's another part of why I wanted to do this podcast, because I do feel like programs are important, but not these programs I, I'm talking about. And I, I want to know how we can actually help kids that that do need help, that have suicidal ideation, that are cutters, that have severe depressive issues, that have mental illness, that that have abusive families, you know, like we don't want them staying in these homes, but where can we have these these places that will actually contribute to like working on the generational trauma like um and that's like a huge part like uh, one of the reasons why I don't blame my mom is because I look at her family and I'm like well fuck like of course you know like and then her like my great grandparents like their generation like it all starts and that's what I'm all about is like breaking patterns and cycles of abuse and like how do we do that though? It's definitely not sending kids to programs like this, but we do need to find other solutions to help support these kids with severe trauma. So how do we do it? I'm asking everybody right now, like how can, how can we? How do you think we could do it? Um, I definitely think local is better. Um, I, I still don't know all the answers for this. Um, there is a mentoring um, program here where I live that is, is, um, it's not in in treatment. It's like a out treatment or whatever. It's not. How do I explain? It's like so kids that are having like problems with drugs or whatever, they meet with these mentors. Like, say I would be a mentor and I would go on hikes with them and um, um, teach them how to belly dance or like spin fire or like skateboard. For example, I, I used to mentor kids with skateboarding and that was like people, these kids that have these issues need, um, ways to move their body. Um, whether it's skateboarding or dancing or writing or like, um, stuff like that, that really help get out their stuff. And they need to be able to talk without being judged. Um, and then, you know, I really do think that if there was more programs when I was when I was 14, local programs um, where I would still stay at home and go to school or, you know, run a fort, whatever. Um, but local programs that I wasn't sent away in a lockdown for years. Um, so I definitely I don't know how, but I, w I want to know, like, I feel like if, if a whole bunch of us that are doing these you know, want to do these docu-series, I definitely think a docu-series should be done on each program, but I also think that we need another part that how can we help these kids that are being, that have these issues in healthy ways that can actually help bring them to be better whole people. I also feel like maybe it would be a good thing <coughs> to have like a reintegration, like not, not a program, but just like a, a place where you could go to help reintegrate into society right after you get out of the program like this. Yeah. And th they do teach you like life skills and stuff, you know, and, but that's what I, my, um, my role as a residential treatment counselor for all those that are judging that name, that's not what it means. Like my role was basically to teach them life skills, um, to run groups on coping skills. If you're having issues cutting, like what can you do instead? Um, that are healthy ways to, to deal with that. Like, um, how do you do resumes? Like I would help people do their resumes or volunteering at the animal shelter so they could put it on the resume. Um, like, like stuff like that. One of my favorite groups I ran was creative writing group. And, um, we would just, they, you know, we'd pick a topic and then you could give them an hour and they would just write. And then they would, uh, if they were open to sharing it, they'd share it and, um, you know, but a lot of these programs, even those programs, um, I don't know, just after COVID, um, a lot of issues started happening with money and finances and shit, and it's just really sad. So I, I don't know 
what the answers are. Um, but I feel like if I could be there for one kid and I've had several girls reach out to me on Facebook and said, you know, you were really there for me. You were really authentic. Like, thank you. And like that, if I could reach, just reach one person to help them, like, that's really all I need, you know? Exactly. Uh, did you ever get into hard drugs? Yes. Okay. You want to talk about that a little bit? What's there to talk about? Okay. Like what, I, like, what did you, what did you start with? Like, what was your DOC? Um, alcohol, weed, acid, mushrooms. And then I got into, um, when I graduated the, or yeah, I guess I got into some speed before that. And then when I graduated the program, I got into, I was on heroin for about a year. Um, and, uh, after I was like right after high school, like, so what, 2001, I graduated high school. Um, I got into heroin for a year and then I met this guy in Portland, my first husband, and I actually quit cold turkey and I haven't touched it since. So okay. I didn't want to once. okay, I was going to ask you how you quit. I'm actually on methadone right now. Um, okay. So I'm on methadone and I smoke weed, but I, I don't do hard drugs anymore. Um, I did them for about 10 years and I was an in intravenous user, so I shouldn't be here right now. Like, I really shouldn't be here right now. So there's I'm like a- glad you are. What? I'm glad you're here. Yeah, there's like a, when I got clean, I just wanted to do something with purpose. So that's why I started this podcast. So just it's pretty, me. I think you're the only one doing these and you're, I've been watching some of your podcasts and it's good that they're out there. So thank you for doing th this. No problem. It needs to be done. And um, is there anything else you want people to know about your experience or anything you might tell a parent thinking about sending their kid to a place like this? The, for the parents, I would ask them to take a look inward <laughs> and see how they were raised and um, work on their own issues. Because, um, you know, we all have issues. Like, I still have issues come up. Like, I'm still constantly working on on things. My brain goes to worst case scenario when something comes up. That's not healthy, you know? So like, I'm constantly figuring out what my triggers are and like working on those. Um, so it's not the easy, don't take the easy way out and send your kid to a program, you know, really. In, and, and really, if you are going to investigate which program it is and do all your research, and there's a lot of research out there right now. Um, when I went, we barely had access to the internet. Um, there was no cell phones or anything like that. So it was a different time. So we have a lot of more um, resources now for, for stuff. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to be, I'm just still trying to heal, but also being there authentically for other people. And I think that's part of the reason why I like doing that. It helps me, keep, it helps keep me accountable in my own life. So I can't go talking to a, to a 15 year old girl about how to have healthy relationships if I can't have a healthy relationship. So, you know, um, I don't know I'm, I'm 41 now and, uh, I'm, pretty much I feel really happy and leveled out in my life right now. Um, but I've also been through a lot, you know, and I feel like a lot of people that have been through things like that tend to get lost in those feelings. And so I feel really lucky that I have been able to not get lost in that, I guess. And, um, there's definitely, I've had my moments, but, um, I've had talking about it helps, you know, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and then I have one more question. <clears throat> when you were sent, um, instead of being sent away to the program, what do you feel like you needed? And what do you feel like would have actually helped you instead of doing instead of that? That's a good question. You know, I've never really asked myself that question, but um, I definitely, I wish my mom would have done more research. But like I said, back then, there was not a lot of research. And so my mom did what she thought was the best. Um, uh, there was a girl, a girl's home here, but back then you had to get court ordered to go there and I was never in the system. So, um, you know, I wish that my mom, my mom did try. She tried to, um, sit me down and talk about what I needed, but I wasn't, she was gone a lot. Um, for her motivational speaking, I was left with nannies and, um, she wasn't really there. And so I think that if she was more present and that's something that she acknowledged, she's like, you know, I, I should have 
done something different in that regard so I could be there for you more when you were acting out. And I think that would have definitely would have helped. But, you know, I have I have five kids. My oldest is 18. Um, he's in college now. I have a 12 year old, a 10 year old, a seven year old and a five month old. And um, they've kind of been in the house when I talked about it. And when this docuseries came out and my 10 year old's like, you would never send me there. Right, mom? I'm like, no, I would never send you there. I would talk to you about what's going on first and we would figure out a plan together. And I think that's what most parents should do is talk together, work something out together um, before sending them to a place like that. Okay, I actually had another question come up. So you said you talked about it a little bit, but have you told your kids what happened to you? And To a certain extent, um, I haven't gone to the, you know, um, I haven't. Like in detail. Uh, yeah, in detail about what happened, but they do know what happened my grandma sent you there and I'm like and I had to explain she didn't know what else to do um but yeah they they know that I was there for a long time and that it's helped that, that they know that it's why that I work with girls like teenage girls that with behavioral and addiction issues you know because I was one of those girls and I wanted to be a person that had a good a good way of doing it not not the bad way or whatever for sure for sure well, thank Allison, you so much. Like, oh. Just on a side note, it's been super hurtful for people in our community with the WASP and the, you know, survival, survivors or whatever. It's been really hurtful when I've been accused of being a staff at a residential treatment facility or a place like Cross Creek and all, all the WASP programs because I'm not. Like, um, if anything starts to even happen like that, I will, I would leave. I would leave and not support a program like that. Um but fortunately, the places I've worked at have not been like that at all. Like I said, it's mainly a halfway house for kids that don't even have family to live with. It's completely different. Yeah, I don't feel like <clears throat> even if like I understand there's animosity towards staff and there's every wretch to be right. But even if you were a staff and you were a survivor, because I, I've interviewed people like that, you still have a place. You should still have a voice. Yes. Which people shouldn't be silenced. Yeah, I mean, that's we, have, we have freedom of speech for a reason. Yeah, exactly. And I really feel like we all share this one thing. And I've, I've made several posts recently, too. Um, people attacking each other, saying, I've, I've had someone come to me and say, you're not healed enough yet. I'm like, you know what? Like, there's so many different layers of all of this. But we share this one thing. We both survived. We all survived being a wasp in a WASP program, you know, and we survived this and then we should come to support each other, not bully each other, depending on different opinions or whatever. Like, let it go, let that stuff go and focus on building and getting all these other programs that are still operating exposed. You know, that's what we need to be focusing on. Exactly, we need to be unified. And I feel like we're getting there more now, especially with the program, but we need to just keep this wave going for, for real. <clears throat> So thank you guys so much for watching so far in the video, if you've watched this far. Well, anyway, if you're watching the video at all, you should be liking the video. That would be awesome. Subscribe to the channel, share the video, and we will see you guys on the next one. Have a wonderful day. Thank Hold you. Yep, yeah, no problem.